On the 16th of September 2018, a radio telescope array in British Columbia picked up a strange chirp from the stars. It was very brief, lasting just 4 milliseconds, and it was very quiet, equivalent to a cell phone signal transmitted from the moon. But it had traveled a lot, lot further than the moon. It had traveled 500 million light years. For the next four days, that radio chirp kept chirping before falling silent for a couple of weeks. Then it started up again, following the same pattern over and over again. And this detection in 2018 was by no means the first or the only one. Fast radio bursts, as they have come to be known, were first discovered by chance back in 2007. Originating from far outside our galactic plane, they typically last less than a second, but they are astoundingly powerful. Researchers have triangulated their sources to be many millions or billions of light years away. So to make it as far as the Earth at all, they must release as much energy in that sharp burst as the Sun does in a year. What's more, scientists now think that they are a common feature of the universe. If we had telescopes watching the whole sky, we would detect one every 10 seconds. Even so, the chirp that was detected in 2018 was special. Among all the fast radio bursts ever intercepted, it is one of only two that repeat on a regular schedule. With its repeating four-day-long period of activity, followed by 12 days of silence, it is unique, and researchers hope that it will help to shed light on the causes of fast radio bursts and solve one of the biggest outstanding mysteries of the universe. Because for all their power and abundance, we still don't know what's behind these intense radio pings. It is tempting, therefore, to daydream that in a large spiral galaxy, not unlike the Milky Way, the source could be intelligent. An advanced species whose mastery of the universe was vastly greater than our own, and whose technology allowed them to harness and release energy in quantities that we could only dream of. But of course, even in the unlikely event that this was the case, whatever the source, it would be long gone now. For the fixed speed of light means that these fast radio bursts began their journey 500 million years ago. And even if the journey had somehow been instant, there wouldn't have been anything to recognize those radio waves when they arrived. For 500 million years ago on Earth, there was no technology. There was no civilization. No sentient life. Indeed, from space, the planet would have looked scarcely any different to how it had for the four billion years since its birth. Blue oceans, white clouds, bare, rocky continents. Indeed, at first glance, there might be no life visible at all. But despite its radio silence and its calm, passive exterior, the planet is a roar with activity and innovation. After a fairly steady 4 billion years, Earth has entered a new era, a new geological period, and a brand new rhythm. Things move fast now. Since animal life exploded onto the scene, the planet has already been through boom and bust, flip-flopping from tropical paradise to suffocating hell and back again. This new Paleozoic world may not be a technological marvel, able to receive signals from millions of light years away, but it is a geological and biological one. It is far different from any time on Earth before, and it sets the stage for all times to come. The Earth took roughly 10 to 20 million years to form, accreting from gas and dust whirling around the Sun. That made sense for the Earth, but it probably isn't the best time frame or method to build your website. Odoo is our sponsor today, and they are a fantastic all-in-one business operation software that offers a range of applications, and the first app is free for life. I went with their time-saving website builder, which is totally free and incredibly simple to use. It just takes a few clicks and works using a drag-and-drop system. Within minutes, you can have a fantastic, fully functioning website. With chat GPT integration that can write, reword, and even change the tone of your text, and a great royalty-free image collection. 
You're also able to easily modify each block by clicking on the element you want to change. Having a website is hugely important these days to boost your presence online, and Odoo offers a free custom domain for one year, with unlimited support and hosting as you do so. It's a top choice. So follow the link in the description below or in the attached comment to try it out, and you will have a fantastic website in minutes. Thanks to Odoo for supporting educational content on YouTube. The wind howls around the control room of the Troll Research Center, sending the anemometer just outside whirling into invisibility. Its sound almost drowns out the crackle from the radio as the room's sole occupant gives her daily weather update. Wind, 35 knots, trending northerly. Temperature, a balmy minus 7 degrees Celsius. Visibility, 5 kilometers. It's another beautiful summer day in the Norwegian quarter of Antarctica, if you don't mind a little wind. Norway's only year-round research station sits somewhat isolated, 235 kilometers away from the Antarctic coast, but its location was not chosen at random. This collection of prefabricated buildings is perched on the bare, exposed rock of Jutalsessen, a bizarrely shaped mountain ridge that stands proudly above the endless ice sea that surrounds it. The station's name itself is thought to derive from the supposed resemblance of these rocks to trolls, the mischief makers of Norwegian myth. Being positioned on the rock gives the resident researchers a rare opportunity to study the solid basement that underlies Antarctica's flowing ice. On the surface, dark brown granites weather to spectacular jagged peaks like the ones that tower above the squat research station while cliffs of grey, tortured, metamorphic rocks are cross-cut by black and white intrusions of igneous rock and mineral veins. Only by closely studying the tiny materials inside this complex tangle of ancient rocks have researchers been able to decode its history and determine that Jutl Sesson, as well as the rest of the 100-kilometer-long Orvin Range, is a remnant of the last great mountain-building event in the assembly of the supercontinent Gondwana, some 530 million years ago. And it was the American paleontologist Charles Doolittle Walcott who first uncovered the fossil puzzle that would reveal the true shape of the Cambrian Earth in 1888. Exploring the east of Newfoundland, Walcott had already made a name for himself as a fossil hunter extraordinaire, and this expedition was no exception. He found woodlouse-like trilobites in great number and curious diversity, from tiny blind agnostids to huge spiny paradoxides, all of which had once thrived on the shallow ocean floor. But there was a problem with the assemblage of fossils he documented. Despite being separated by just a few hundred kilometers, they were completely different from the species found in the shallow seafloor rocks of the same age in western Newfoundland and it would take another 50 years and the rise of the theory of plate tectonics before scientists would arrive at the correct explanation. Through petrological, paleomagnetic and fossil evidence, geologists were able to reconstruct an ancient, vanished ocean more than 3,000 kilometers wide named the Iapetus, in roughly the same location as the Northern Atlantic today. Things changed fast and drastically after the snowball glaciations that marked the end of the Neoproterozoic around 630 million years ago. During that freezing time for the planet, lasting almost 100 million years, many of the Earth's continental masses were assembled over the South Pole. They may have been clustered or they may have been combined into a vast supercontinent named Pannotia. But the end of the Neoproterozoic saw the end of Pannotia. New ocean basins ripped through the once consolidated mass of continents, casting out Laurentia, which now forms much of modern North America, and Baltica, whose remnants today form Northern Europe. Between Laurentia and Baltica, a mid-ocean ridge sundered and began to spread, opening up a huge ocean basin much like the modern Atlantic. This was the Iapetus, and yet for all its vastness, the only evidence of its existence today is in a narrow band of crumpled rocks and the curious puzzle of Cambrian fossils Walcott found in 1888, running through England, Scotland, Ireland, 
and Newfoundland. For just 10 million years or so later, Laurentia and Baltica would begin moving together again to close the Iapetus Ocean. But in the late Cambrian at least, the North American and European continents enjoyed their independence. However, the same could not be said for the rest of the planet's ancient continents. As the remnant mountain range in Antarctica upon which the Troll Research Station sits attests, the breakup of Pannotia did not see a wholesale scattering of continental masses. Indeed, even while Laurentia and Baltica were breaking free, the modern-day southern continents were still strengthening their association. South America and Africa were nuzzled together as their puzzle piece geometry suggests. Madagascar was squeezed tight between eastern Africa and India, with Antarctica pressed in close beneath it. Finally, Australia shouldered into the continental scrum, slotting in between eastern India and Antarctica. Together, this vast assemblage of continental masses, as the earliest incarnation of the Gondwan and supercontinent, covered around a fifth of the Earth's surface. It lay almost exclusively in the southern hemisphere, hovering close to, but not directly over, the South Pole. The weathered surface of rock beneath the Troll Research Station was therefore once the heart of a mighty mountain range. And peering out of the control room window at the shattered rocks beyond, this lone scientist could easily imagine herself perched on the slopes of the Cambrian Kunga Mountains in their prime, in central Gondwana. There are no birds here, no insects, no plants blowing in the wind. Only a few coloured lichens eke out an existence on the tumbled boulders of the talus slopes. There's little moisture in the air, and few clouds to shield the rocks from the relentless sun. Such is how we might find the interior of Cambrian Gondwana on the wrong side of the Kunga's rain shadow. In many ways, Antarctica's Orvin Mountains form a tiny, modern window onto conditions on the Cambrian continent. But there is one big difference, and that is temperature. While Troll today shivers in a cold desert, the mountains of the Kunga Range rise from an altogether different desert, among the hottest that the world has ever seen. While its long coastline enjoyed a maritime climate, with moist, variable weather and moderate temperatures, the endless continental interior of Gondwana was subject to the harsh climatic extreme that such large landmasses breed. Humidity from the oceans can only be transported so far, and the mountain ranges born from continental assembly act to further block the penetration of clouds and rainfall. Thousands upon thousands of square kilometers lay dry, barren and empty, their solid rock surfaces only weathered by the shattering heat and abrasive wind. It was an inhospitable place, even if there were any life forms on Earth yet able to call it home. Delving into the genetics of modern plants, it's possible to estimate when they made their first forays onto land, based on how common the genes for subaerial survival are, cross-referenced with the time it takes for such genes to evolve. These so-called molecular clocks do seem to suggest that plants had acquired some of the genetic toolkit for surviving out of the water by 500 million years ago. And yet, if there were any such hardy terrestrial pioneers, there is as yet no evidence of them in the fossil record. That in itself is not so surprising. Early plants lacked the hard, woody vascular structures that are most likely to leave a trace in the rocks, while comparatively dry terrestrial environments don't easily produce the conditions needed for making a fossil. Gigantic Gondwana was drier and much more hostile than most landmasses, making it even harder for continental colonizers to gain a roothold or leave their mark. If the interminable desert of central Gondwana wasn't hostile enough by itself, throughout the late Cambrian, the supercontinent's eastern realms were subjected to their own unique flavor of hell. Today, more than 2 million square kilometers of the Australian subcontinent, spanning Western Australia, the Northern Territory, Queensland and South Australia, are underlain by volcanic rocks. 
dating from a single event that took place a little over 500 million years ago. They are known as the Kalkaringi Flood Basalts, and they are the result of an immense outpouring of lava from a volcanic eruption that took place on a scale never yet witnessed by humanity. This was not an explosive eruption like Mount St. Helens, but a relatively gentle yet persistent flow of runny lava from one or many rifts in the solid crust. Perhaps the closest analogue today are the flows of basaltic lava that continually reshape their landscape in Iceland. But the largest of these flows to take place in human history, the Elkir eruption of the 10th century, covered about 780 square kilometres with basaltic lava. The Kalkaringi flows were more than two and a half thousand times greater. From fissures in the ground many kilometres long, lava first sprayed and then serenely poured as if from a never-ending reservoir. The deadly golden rivers flowed inexorably downhill, carving channels in the barely cooled landscape and spreading out into soft-edged lobes at the end of their runs, until the fissures and vents were finally exhausted and a brand new basaltic plain, three times the size of Texas, had been created. And it was not just molten rock that effused from these fissures, along with the lava came gases, great billowing plumes of water vapour that filled the otherwise clear Gondwanan skies with steamy clouds, and, invisible but no less pernicious, carbon dioxide in staggering quantities. Scientists estimate that more than one and a half trillion tonnes of the gas was emitted in the decades-long basalt flood. This eruption alone contributed an extra 2% of carbon dioxide to the Cambrian air, no doubt affecting what was a remarkable time for the global atmosphere and climate. It's still difficult to know with any great certainty what climatic conditions were like 500 million years ago, but clues in the chemistry and formation of the rocks from the time point to conditions very different from those of the preceding Neoproterozoic, or today. Carbon dioxide may have reached staggering concentrations, some 16 times higher than even current levels, and its warming effect as a greenhouse gas would have contributed to average global temperatures of up to 22 degrees Celsius, compared to the modern average of 15 degrees as we stand on the cusp of catastrophic global warming. It's not hard to imagine how inescapably sweltering the Cambrian world would have been. The interior of Gondwana, suffering from the privations of continentality, could have baked at temperatures hot enough to break apart organic molecules, essentially sterilizing the continent from even bacterial life. The coasts, the cooling ocean could have given some relief, but the humidity and ensuing storms would have made this refuge a turbulent one. And of all the rocks laid down at this time, no evidence has been found that suggests that ice existed at the poles. This was made possible partly because none of the late Cambrian continents lay directly over the pole to act as a geologically and thermodynamically stable platform for an ice cap. But either way, ice's absence is scarcely surprising in such a hot, greenhouse environment. Conditions at the surface may have been unbearable, but the main consequence of such high temperatures and the lack of ice around the globe is that all of the water on the planet is now free to cycle between the atmosphere, rivers, and oceans. Today, some 2% of Earth's water is locked away, frozen as glaciers and ice sheets, and we are all acutely aware of the devastating sea level rises that even just a small melting of that ice will bring about. But with it all gone, as in the late Cambrian, those sea level rises would have been as extreme as at any time in Earth's history, topping out at up to 90 meters above present-day levels. Of course, at this time, there were no coastal cities, civilizations, or even habitats to be drowned by the encroaching ocean, but there were plenty of communities that stood to benefit. Just as the Kalkaringi lavas flooded out over the ancient Australian landscape, the Cambrian Ocean waters flooded over the fringes of all the ancient continents. The result was a vast expanse of shallow, tropical ocean shelves around the edges of all the land masses. Shallow enough for the sun to penetrate to the sea floor across much of their area and to readily exchange oxygen with the atmosphere, 
they were also close to the rocky landmasses to feed off nutrients from terrestrial weathering. Sheltered just below the water's surface, a hair's breadth from the steamy, stormy hellscape above, these were aquatic Edens where life forms could want for nothing. The perfect environment for life to experiment. Adam Sedgwick pulled the oilskin closer around him and spared a glance at the glowering grey clouds that loomed above him, pricking his ears for the sound of thunder. The last thing he wanted was to be caught out by a storm while he was so exposed on this bare Welsh mountainside. It would hardly do for the morning papers to report that the Cambridge professor and president of the Geological Society had been struck dead by lightning. He threw his second glance in the direction of his young field assistant, 30 feet away, and saw that the enthusiastic but inexperienced Charles Darwin had no care for their meteorological peril. He had his nose pressed so close to the boulder at the lake shore as to make the rest of Cum Idwal, and indeed his mentor, all but disappear. It was 1831. The English geologist and mapping pioneer William Smith had demonstrated some 30 years prior that the relationships between rocks that outcrop in cliffs, road cuttings, and beneath our feet can give their relative age to one another. Layers that laid on top of others were younger, having been deposited after those that languished beneath. So far, so simple. But the real mastery was in untangling the present-day pattern of folded, faulted, and regionally discontinuous rock formations to piece together a complete and consistent geological history. And the key to doing that, William Smith had asserted, was fossils. So now Sedgwick and his acolyte, as well as many other English gentleman geologists with the means and motivation, were taking it upon themselves to map the rocks of England, Wales, and Scotland. In a time long before any understanding of plate tectonics or evolution, or indeed any agreement on the age of the Earth, these scholars were carving out the major geological ages. Darwin wasn't Sedgwick's usual field companion. Instead, Sedgwick was more often seen with his friend and colleague, the drastically more capable field geologist, Roderick Murchison. It may come as a surprise, therefore, that these two, Sedgwick and Murchison, were the root of one of the biggest controversies in 19th century geology, in a fight that would see the pair estranged from one another until the end of their lives. And at the heart of this bitter dispute, the honour of naming the rocks that contained the very first fossils of life on Earth. It began in the early 1830s, with both geologists working independently to log and map the rocks of Wales. Murchison focused on the borders and mid-Wales, where he used fossils of trilobites and clam-like brachiopods to define the Silurian geological system. Meanwhile, Sedgwick's fieldwork took him to North Wales, and exposures like those he explored at Cumidwell with the young Charles Darwin. There were fewer fossils here, so instead the professor used other characteristics of the rocks to chart the changing geological formations and define his own geological system, named after the Latin word for Wales, the Cambrian. All seemed well with the pair's independent conclusions, but their camaraderie was not to last. Somewhere in between the two scholars' field sites, the rocks of Sedgwick's Cambrian seemed to overlap with those of Murchison's Silurian. Rocks that we know today are around 500 million years old. So, to whom did they belong? Murchison said that the fossils in these overlapping rocks were not different enough from his Silurian ones to be considered distinct, and so claimed the top part of Sedgwick's sections for his own. For that matter, he reasoned none of the so-called Cambrian fossils showed any standout characteristic that separated them from those of the Silurian, so Murchison wasted little time in sweeping all of Sedgwick's rock formations into his own system. 
Of course, today, the Cambrian period is still within the Geological Dictionary, and still defines the period with the earliest unquestionable fossils, so we can rest easy that Sedgwick got his justice in the end. But that justice didn't come until 1879, six years after Sedgwick's death. Although the scholars' Welsh sections had been poor in fossils, further exploration around the country and further afield led to the discovery of more truly distinctive Cambrian fossils, providing justification for his original conclusions and running from 538 to 485 million years ago. And Murchison got to keep his Silurian period as well, running from 443 to 419 million years ago. The resolution to the contentious overlap was the definition of a third geological system, which became known as the Ordovician, sandwiched in between. And so, in time, the true riches of the Cambrian period would reveal themselves. The discovery of remarkably preserved soft-body fossils in the Burgess Shale of Canada, in Chengjiang in China, and many other places besides, have opened a window on the spectacular explosion of life that is now defined as beginning with the beginning of the Cambrian. Sedgwick never knew how valuable the prize of his period was, and he would never know that his claim was secure. Animal life as we know it arrived onto the scene over a few short tens of millions of years, starting around 539 million years ago in an event fittingly described as the Cambrian Explosion. The reasons why it happened so suddenly, and at that particular point in time, have been scrutinized by paleontologists for over a hundred years, with no clear answer as of yet. But what is known is that recognizable macroscopic life and almost all of the animal phyla, the major groupings that define chordates like us, mollusks like oysters and octopuses, and every kind of worm imaginable, appeared within a geological blink of the eye. Apparently without following the bizarre example of the soft, quilted bodies of the Ediacaran and biota at the end of the Neoproterozoic, the early Cambrian organisms diversified explosively, learning how to build hard, protective shells, to swim freely in the water, and burrow down into the sea floor, all the while exploiting new food sources. All of this diversity still only existed in the oceans, but with a warm climate, no ice, and elevated sea levels, there was plenty of ocean to go around. By 500 million years ago, the late Cambrian marine environment would have been a breathtaking scene. At first familiar, with its reefs and sunlit waters filled by colourful lifeforms bustling about their lives with a skittish air of self-protection, but a closer look would reveal the scene to be unnervingly alien. While the animal forms that colonise the Cambrian Ocean do belong to the modern phyla, they are what's known as basal forms, the first experiments into living with a particular body plan before the pressures of environment and competition have caused them to evolve, refining and branching into the denizens of their group that are preserved in the Phanerozoic fossil record and which survive to today. And so the reefs that rise up off the sandy sea floor, reaching for the sunlight, are not made of the branching, spreading, or gently waving tentacled corals that the modern snorkeler would expect, but rather they're a jumbled assemblage from oddly delicate, cone-shaped structures known as archaeocyathids. These organisms have not survived past the Cambrian and have no clear existing descendants, but paleontologists believe them to be allied with the sponges belonging to the phylum Periphera. Like the sponges that exist today, they lived as filter feeders, channeling water through pores in their skeleton to extract the tiny plankton that floated helplessly within. With their double-walled, conical calcite skeletons reaching up to half a meter in height, and stacked on top of one another in a bid to reach the nutrient-rich waters of the photic zone, these Cambrian archaeocyathid reefs look more like a well-stocked ice cream parlor than any reef we would find today. Likewise, representatives of the new animal phyla may not appear quite as we expect in these Cambrian seas. The chordates defined by the nerve that runs, like a cord, along their bodies, 
today comprise all animals with a backbone. These number some of the largest and most charismatic of the ocean's denizens, from the great blue whale to the great white shark, and every fish and aquatic mammal in between. But in the Cambrian seas, chordates were just getting started. They had no bones, but strengthened their bodies with cartilage. They also had no limbs, but they had segmented blocks of muscles to help them squirm, writhe, and undulate through the water and across the sea floor. The basal chordates, like Picaia, Yunanazuon, once called Hyquella, Myloconmingia, and Metasprogena, would have looked and moved similarly to modern eels and lampreys, but in miniature. Most of these early chordates topped out at just 5 centimeters long. The phylum that is most closely related to the chordates, to us, is surprisingly the echinoderms. Their modern representatives can be found in tidal rock pools and shallow tropical oceans as spiked sea urchins, heart-shaped sand dollars, and multifarious starfish. But all of these are derivations, the product of hundreds of millions of years of refining evolution. The earlier echinoderms that could be found lurking in the Cambrian seas looked barely anything like their modern cousins. Their enclosing outer shells were constructed from individual calcified plates, but therein the similarities end. Instead of an ordered five-part symmetry, these early urchins experimented with a more freeform kind of body plan. Some, like the eocrinoids, were cup-shaped, anchored to the seafloor like a goblet, with plated arms reaching upward into the water column. Others, like the tenacistoids, looked a little like limbless silverfish, with flattened oval bodies bearing a movable, comb-like apparatus at their front end. Whether for eating or for movement, we are still not sure. Finally, the helicoplacoids have the appearance of a towel wrung out to dry, if that towel happened to be made of rigid armour. With a distinctive spiral pattern to their interlocking plates, as well as to their mouths as well, this elongated rugby ball-shaped creature could stretch and squash its body to generate water currents around itself to feed without ever moving from one place. The fauna of these Cambrian waters was unlike anything the Earth had seen before, or would see again. With barely any modern analogues, measuring animal diversity in the aftermath of the Cambrian explosion is far from straightforward. Certainly, the animal life was alien from that of modern day oceans, but how does it rate in terms of overall diversity and abundance? It is a question that has puzzled paleoecologists since Sedgwick and Murchison first sparred over the earliest animal fossils nearly 200 years ago. To begin with, merely counting the number of species is unreliable, since we are limited by the imperfect fossil record and what our equally imperfect interpretations can tell us. The general consensus is that the richness of animal life increased explosively at the beginning of the Cambrian and kept increasing, even by some measures doubling, during the Paleozoic. So in 2007, a group of American paleontologists forged a new approach to measuring ecological richness, which depends less on what marine fossil organisms look like and more on how they lived. Called an ecospace, it can be visualized as a large cube, made of 216 smaller cubes, numbering six on each side. Each position along each of the sides represents a particular way of living. Along the cube's length are feeding strategies, from suspension feeding, to grazing, to preparation. Along its width, there are degrees of motility, from staying attached to a surface, to moving fast or slow. And along the cube's vertical axis is tiering, or where in the marine environment they made their home. From deep in the sediment, to on the surface, or up in the water itself. So a free-swimming, predatory shark would occupy one small square, and a rooted, suspension-feeding coral would occupy another in the opposite side of ecospace. By categorizing fossil organisms into this ecospace, paleoecologists can see at a glance how many of the possible ways of living are being exploited by ancient communities. And changes in ecospace filling over time can tell the story of extinction and radiation arguably better than any individual count of fossil species. 
By this measure, the ecospace count during the preceding Ediacaran period, when only enigmatic quilted organisms lurked near the ocean's surface, was just 10 out of a possible 216, clustering around the non-moving, surface suspension and deposit feeders. By contrast, the Cambrian Ocean had tripled its ecospace filling, most notably through the exploitation of new habitats beneath and above the ocean's surface. The Cambrian explosion had not only seen the rapid appearance of new and bizarre forms of life, but the invention of completely new ways of living. There were now free-swimming predators, burrowing worms, floating suspension feeders, and an abundance of fast-moving bottom feeders. And yet, this is still but a small proportion of all the possible ways of living, with less than 14% of the total ecospace filled. So while the Cambrian ecological innovation was remarkable, inventing both the major animal body parts and many new ecological modes, evolution still had far to go to create a marine ecosystem like the one we see today. Indeed, evolution still has room to manoeuvre, since our modern oceans still only fill less than 100 out of the possible 216 incremental ecosystems. Even now, there are no predators who make a living attached to floating debris or fast-moving bottom feeders living in shallow sediment, and many others besides. And so, this Cambrian fauna, as shown by the limited ecospace filling, is composed primarily of suspension feeders and sediment grazers that lived right at or near the sediment interface. It is defined by many of the simple but numerous shelly fossils that can be found in Cambrian and Ordovician rocks all over the world. But over and above all else, there are trilobites, like the Newfoundland examples that clued Charles Doolittle Walcott into the great missing Iapetus Ocean. Indeed, just as the Jurassic and Cretaceous might be described as the age of dinosaurs, the Cambrian and Ordovician were the age of the trilobite. In 1862, the British geologist J.W. Salter was attempting to map the rocks that outcropped around the coast of St. David's Peninsula in southwest Wales. He decided that the best way to do this, to gain access to the sheer cliffs that drop perilously into the sea, was by boat. But while Salter may have been a skilled geologist, he was not quite so adept at marine navigation. At the end of his mapping day, he turned his skiff into an inlet he believed to be Solver Harbour, but was in fact a dead end, the narrow bay of Porthirao. He was lucky. Many navigators who have made the same mistake in coastlines around the world have found themselves run aground. But Salter came across a calm and sheltered bay where he could moor his boat, and, never being one to miss an opportunity, he examined the rocks before him and it was in these rocks he found the treasure of a lifetime. It was a trilobite, that much was obvious, from its helmet-like cranium and numerous stacked thoracic segments, but it was on a scale he could scarcely believe. Because while most trilobites then known to science were on the order of a few centimetres long, this extraordinary example was almost half a metre in length. It has since been named Paradoxides Davidi and is now celebrated as Wales' national fossil. But trilobites don't have to be large in order to be impressive. These woodlouse-like animals are so named because of the three-lobed appearance of their dorsal shells, which are further subdivided into head, thorax and tail sections. But therein, the similarities between members of the group ends. Because so far, more than 20,000 species of trilobite have been identified across 11 separate orders. They ranged in size from just a few millimetres to up to 70 centimetres in length, and had adopted every possible lifestyle that was practical for an animal of their particular design. There were blind scavengers that lived inside the sediment, in dark crevices or below the photic zone. There were masters of defence, with long thoraxes made from thick articulated segments, allowing them to roll into a protective ball. There were elaborately spiny species, 
whose sharp protuberances may have been a deterrent to predators or may have been a way of sensing disturbances in the water. And then there were trilobite eyes. Compound eyes made from tens of thousands of individual crystals of calcite, like gemstones, specifically oriented and arranged to give remarkable depth and clarity of vision in the varied and dark waters of the Cambrian Ocean. The arrangement of these lenses show astounding diversity, suited to each individual species' lifestyle. Most are curved to give a wide field of vision for spotting predators or prey approaching from the front, side or behind. Some are raised on stalks to allow the trilobite to burrow down beneath the sediment to lay an ambush of unsuspecting prey. And some have huge, bulging, dome-shaped eyes that dominate the size of their heads and allow 360-degree vision in all directions when swimming freely through the water. Truly, the trilobites were the triumph of the Cambrian fauna, the masters of all they beheld. And so, it is clear to see from the individual fossils, the paleoecology and the cosmopolitan trilobite-dominated community of these tropical seas, that 500 million years ago, life was enjoying meteoric success. But the story of life in these oceans hadn't always been one of unfettered victory, because amongst all this experimentation, innovation and diversification, there was also crisis and hardship. For 500 million years ago, the animal communities that had poured their evolutionary energies into this newfound Eden had already faced an extinction event. One that saw almost half of them struck prematurely from the Earth. Tourists flock to the arm-shaped peninsula of Cape Cod in Massachusetts for the ultimate nature lover's vacation. Hundreds of kilometers of sandy coastline offer endless opportunities for water sports, wildlife watching, and dining out on sumptuous seafood. Sheltered bays and ponds are the perfect place for paddleboards and kayaks, while the low, green, rolling landscape is ideal for relaxing walks among the unspoiled beauty of nature. The region has made a name for itself as one of the happiest places to live in America, and it's a top destination for retirees, but the 200,000 or so permanent residents are thoroughly outnumbered by more than 4 million annual visitors. But all of it is under threat, and in the next few years, the beauty and bounty of the Cape could be lost altogether. For visitors in the next few years will be greeted by a pervasive rotting odor among the bays and ponds. There will be no local fish on the restaurant menus, and boat propellers and oars will be so clogged with debris as to make whale watching and water sports a thing of the past. And this isn't some far future worst case scenario. Even in 2022, conservators estimated that 90% of the Cape's coastal waters would need immediate restoration. And it's all because of an excess of nitrogen in the water. In this, Cape Cod is not unique. Uncontrollable, choking algal blooms are becoming a common sight around the world, especially in estuaries where the chemical products of intensive farming make their way into the sea. But farming isn't the reason why Cape Cod's aquatic habitats are suffocating. Rather, the popular destination has become a victim of its own success, with the nitrogen pollution coming from too much urine entering the ocean. Out of the 15 small towns on the Cape, most of them have no sewers, relying instead on septic tanks that only catch solids while letting the wastewater flow into the ground and then the sea, completely untreated. When that wastewater includes the nitrogen-rich urine from millions of tourists, it's little wonder that Cape Cod's waters are struggling. And it's a problem that's only projected to get worse as the number of annual visitors is expected to grow. Like the apocalyptic red tides that beset the coast of Florida, this yellow tide threatens the habitats, ecosystems, and overall environment of the Cape. All because something, in this case nitrogen, sent the system teetering off balance. 
These kinds of tipping points and their catastrophic consequences are becoming a common feature of our modern, changing world. But the Earth has experienced many such crises in its long history. And it is now becoming apparent that the Cambrian Oceans experienced one such crisis around 500 million years ago. The fossil record reveals that for a few tens of million years after the Cambrian explosion, animal life experienced the ultimate boom time, with both extrinsic environmental conditions and intrinsic evolutionary potential working in step, resulting in unprecedented diversification and radiation through the planet's shallow tropical oceans. But any economist, as well as the residents of Cape Cod, will be the first to tell you that you can have too much of a good thing. The overreaching and overexploitation of resources during a boom sends the system off balance and invariably leads to a bust. The wildly successful Cambrian ecosystems would have been a delight to behold, but they were a system tipping dangerously off balance. Now that an abundance of fossils of both hard and soft-bodied animals have been recovered from the entire Cambrian period, it is possible for paleontologists to chart the rise of animals in precise detail. But those records reveal something surprising. The extended Cambrian radiation was not a tale of uninterrupted success, and that rise in ecosystem richness was not a continuous one. About 513 million years ago and 509 million years ago, there were instead sharp drops in species abundance and diversity. Together, they comprise a pair of mid-Cambrian extinctions that have been named the Sinsk Event and the batomian toyonian Crisis. Between these two sharp jags, amid the otherwise upward trend of Cambrian success, paleontologists see an alarming loss of up to 45% of all newly forged animal genera, particularly focused upon those with hard, mineralized skeletons, among which around 83% of genera disappear. The Archaeocyathids, those ice cream cone shaped reef builders of the early Cambrian, are among the most notable of losses, leaving their heaped and hopeful skeletons behind as ghostly reminders of their ultimately unfulfilled potential. And many species of trilobite met their demise as well, including groups that were among the very first trilobites of all, which had been especially dominant on the opposite shores of the Iapetus Ocean and included the famed Welsh giant Paradoxides. Indeed, many of the organisms that had been so iconic in the Cambrian Oceans never made it out of those seas. It's clear from the chronology alone that with boom and bust in such quick succession, the mid-Cambrian was not a stable time for the Earth. But the cause of these extinction events is not immediately obvious. There are no asteroid strikes, no global glaciations. Even the Australian flood basalts and their massive outgassing of greenhouse gases took place after the ecosystem change, so the two cannot be related. There is one clue, however, lurking in the rocks of the period that could help geologists to piece together the events of the mid-Cambrian. Known as the Steptoean Positive Isotope Carbon Excursion, or more simply, SPICE, it relates to a marked change in the balance of carbon isotopes inside limestone, which in turn tells us about conditions in the ancient ocean. There are two stable isotopes of carbon. Carbon-12 is the most abundant. Carbon-13 is endowed with an extra neutron in its nucleus, making it marginally heavier. It accounts for just over 1% of Earth's carbon reservoir. And in recent decades, Geochemists have used high-precision mass spectroscopy to measure the quantities of each of these isotopes in carbon-bearing rocks, such as limestone. This is because the balance of carbon-12 to carbon-13 in the atmosphere is heavily controlled by biological productivity. Ultimately, life is lazy and won't expend more energy than it needs to. So, photosynthesizing organisms will preferentially take up lighter carbon-12 from the atmosphere leaving behind the heavier, more energetically costly carbon-13. And so many of the big extinctions on Earth are marked by negative carbon-13 excursions, reflecting mass dying all over the world. And yet, the space event records the opposite. 
a positive carbon-13 excursion around 500 million years ago, lasting 2 to 4 million years, implies enhanced primary productivity at this time. More photosynthesizers fixing lightweight carbon and draining it from the atmosphere. Usually, it would follow that more production at the base of a food chain means more food for the consumers who rely on it. But this is not necessarily the story that these carbon isotopes tell. Because although the lightweight carbon is captured, it's not cycled up through animals and back into the air, but is locked away. The photosynthesizers, algae and cyanobacteria, are living and dying in such numbers that their organic material is buried before it can be used. And so could this be a clue to the mid-Cambrian animal extinctions? Was it a lack of food that somehow drove these early Shelley fauna to their demise? It seems unlikely. Unfortunately, the exact dates of the spice event don't quite line up with those of the extinctions, coming several million years after the big drops in animal genera. If anything, the positive excursion that the spice event records is a consequence of the extinction, rather than its cause. There is, however, one more tantalizing clue. In eastern Nevada, around 320 kilometers north of Las Vegas, Shingle Peak rises nearly 3,000 meters above sea level and is composed of fossiliferous limestones that date back to this crucial period in Cambrian history. Here, scientists have traced the spice event in the carbon isotopes, but they have also found crystals of fool's gold, iron pyrite, decorating the rock layers like beads on a necklace. Pyrite is an iron sulfide, which forms in sedimentary rocks where there is abundant sulfur and not very much oxygen, or else the sulfur would react to become a sulfate. Pyrite in this context is widely considered to be an indication of anoxic water conditions, something that is confirmed by examination of the sulfur isotopes within those crystals. And it's not just Shingle Peak that wears this evidence of anoxia like gaudy jewelry. All around the world, rocks from the mid-Cambrian, concurrent with the faunal extinctions, show the hallmark signs of a drop in oxygen concentrations. This probably didn't come from a drop in atmospheric oxygen, but rather a deoxygenation of the ocean floor. The same ocean floor that played host to diverse animal ecosystems. With this final piece of the puzzle, the mid-Cambrian extinction is starting to make sense. The Cambrian explosion saw ecosystem evolution supercharged for a few tens of millions of years. Some speculate that it was precipitated by a rise in atmospheric oxygen, or continental configurations pumping abundant nutrients into the shallow, tropical waters. Either way, it was a time of unprecedented biological success, not just for the newly evolved animals, but also for the aquatic photosynthetic algae and bacteria that fed those animals in the first place. But all this growth sent the ecosystem tipping, and then tumbling, out of balance. Algae could grow wherever there was sunlight and nutrition, and with the warm temperatures and weathering of a newly fractured continent, there was no shortage of either. If the foundling animals couldn't keep up with such abundant vegetative growth, then that growth would continue exponentially, unchecked. This meant that much of the Cambrian seas could have experienced the same fate that the urine-soaked shores of Cape Cod now face. Algae grow out of control, before dying and decomposing, drawing all of the oxygen out of the water from the sea floor upwards. And it's likely that warm global temperatures and a lack of ice at the poles contributed to ocean circulation stalling leaving many of these deoxygenated seafloors suffocating and stagnating for millennia. The animals that called them home didn't stand a chance. Ultimately, the faunal crisis that interrupted the Cambrian's halcyon days of summer probably came about as a result of life living just a little too hard. Thankfully, this period was relatively short-lived, and whether through some intrinsic feedback or a change in nutrient flow to the oceans, conditions improved by the end of the Cambrian to allow the ecosystem to regain some balance 
and recover. The mid-Cambrian extinctions may have been noteworthy for the proportion of animal genera lost, but looked at another way, the absolute magnitude of these mass dyings was not actually that great. There was a much lower density of forms among the Metazoan phyla than at any other time in the Phanerozoic. There were perhaps only a total of 600 distinct genera at the peak of the Cambrian radiation, which was reduced to around 450 by the end of the period. Compared to the 73,500 genera known to exist today, both the total diversity and losses sustained are so small as to be almost unremarkable. And yet even so, those surviving genera were remarkable. The animal groups that appeared in the aftermath of the Cambrian explosion and which had the temerity, tenacity or simple good fortune to survive through life's meteoric rise and catastrophic fall were the ones that would shape the founding branches of the tree of animal life. These early extinctions almost acted as a filter, culling the delicate, vulnerable forms and favouring the more resilient. We may mourn the loss of some of the Cambrian's most experimental organisms, but the ones that survived would be our founders, defining the course of evolution for the next 500 million years. A course of evolution that would eventually lead to us. You've been watching the entire history of the Earth. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.